want to bring me happy To all Delta, Alpha, and Beta Quadrant galaxy lifeforms in our vast Milky Way galaxy, welcome to a Captain's Log. I'm your host, Brian Kreutz, joined by the greatest co-host in all of our galaxy, Lily Fox Lim. <laughs> oh, thank you, BK. You know, we're in the studio, also known as the Ambassador's Quarters, and I think right now would be the moment that our Animaniac Android Raj would say, of course, there are four quadrants, so we are airing on television sets in the Gamma Quadrant of the Milky Way Galaxy. 25th century technology enables satellite-style broadcasts emanating from Sector 001 on Earth to be picked up on subspace communication channels in all four quadrants of the galaxy. <laughs> it does sound like Raj. What is he? Oh, Raj. <laughs> oh, Raj would ramble along those lines. I could definitely hear it right now, Lily. Sounds like you already miss our walking, talking, traveling tin man, Raj. Never tell him. Okay. <laughs> I won't say anything. Secret safe with me. Raj is taking a shuttlecraft to Vulcan, and it may take a few weeks for him to reach the outer rim. <laughs> yes, but on his way, our ambassador's assistant is stopping by planet Ornara here nearby in the Delos system. Remember the character Romas from the first season, Next Gen episode, Symbiosis? Yes, I do. We covered Symbiosis in our show from last season. That was the 10 best episodes that exemplify the ideals of Star Trek, oh, remember? a good one. Yeah. Yes. Now, Romas the Onaran, like other members of his species, were addicted to the drug Felicium. So... You're telling me we get to speak to the actor today, Richard Lineback? Wow, you're so <laughs> smart. Yes, the very talented Richard Lineback, who also appeared in other Star Trek and in one of your favorite films, Twister. Oh, yes. He'll be our guest on a captain's log this week. I love Twister. What's not to <laughs> like about it? So, the USS Cerritos, all these years later, we were welcomed warmly by local magistrate Benir from planet Ornara. Now, Ramos has a nice place in history, and it'll be so nice to ask Richard Lineback about his role in The Next Generation. Plus other Star Trek series he appeared in as well. Yeah, and you know, BK, before we talk to Richard, our Star Trek news segment has now upon us. Yes. So let's hear what we got. You and I always love sharing the latest and greatest headlines with our fans here on uh, our Star Trek talk show. We do. Uh, lots of good news and reveals this week. Trekkies, two Star Trek series received orders for another season this Ooh. week, which includes 10 more episodes. You know, I kind of wish they still had those 26 episode seasons. But hey. Yeah, we'll take what we can get, but we always want more Trek. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do, Lily. More Star Trek. Now, the Star Trek Lower Deck series was renewed, and Star Trek Strange New Worlds will have yet another season after this summer when they're both released. Yes, more Beckett and Boehms. <laughs> and at a time when Trek fans have been very seriously rallying around the idea of a Picard spinoff. Oh, yeah. We're anticipating an announcement soon after Picard wraps their finale. Can't wait. A Captain's Lock returns in a moment. Welcome back to a Captain's Log. We are moments away from being joined by Richard Lineback, our special guest today. Yes, Lily. Richard not only portrayed characters in many of the top blockbuster films, as in Speed, Twister, Varsity Blues, Natural Born Killers, and The Ring, he's played three very memorable characters on three different Star Trek series. Yes, Richard Lineback was heavily into television roles on hit series like MASH, Fantasy Island, The Waltons, Knight Rider, Hunter, and Dallas. Richard Lineback, welcome to A Captain's Log. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, I like your show. I've seen, I've seen episodes of it, and um, thank you for having me on. Richard, you were born in Frankfurt, Germany, and then you moved with your family to Austin, Texas, and finally landed in Los Angeles after college. Please tell us about your early days starting out performing as an actor and joining the Colony Theater Company here in North Hollywood over by Burbank. My mother got me into acting, actually. Uh, the, the reason that I was born in Germany was I was kind of an, I was an army brat for half of my childhood. And my dad wound up retiring uh, in, in Austin, Texas. University of Texas summer theater program was going on because I had just moved there. I went and I studied drama and my brother who had a friend in California after I graduated, I was working in a, a Hilton hotel as a room service waiter and uh, loving that too. 
uh, I was young, everything was cool, everything was easy, I had no thoughts of the future. So I said, he said, why don't you come out to Los Angeles, see what you can do. And um, I did. I, I came out and my room was a curtained off part of, of a Hollywood bungalow living room. And uh, so it was three guys living there. And uh, I, I waited for a while before trying to join a theater company because I was very unsure of myself. Wow, a very nice start for you, Richard. And ultimately, then you joined the Colony Theater Company in North Hollywood. I was incredibly lucky. Now, Richard, your first on-screen credit was actually a two-part episode for the popular TV series The Love Boat in 1978. Were your ambitions now shifting to be a successful TV actor in Los Angeles, as a lot of your early roles were on television? And how did this role as steward come about? Yes. Um, casting director had been there and was somebody who, who went to our theater a lot and saw me in several shows. And I needed a, I needed a union card. And so uh, she said, uh, uh, would you like to do this role and cast me. And I literally had one line. I, it was right. Not only one line, but one word. It was right. Uh, <laughs> take, take her bags up to the room and I go, right. Uh, you know something that's very unusual was that the guest star was Stephanie Zimbalist. And as it turns out, like 30 years later, I starred with her in the baby dance, which was a um, which was a play that went from the Pasadena Playhouse to to New York. And I spent a lot of time with her and I, I always marveled at the very first thing I ever did was some with somebody that I was going to, I, we spent actually years, you know, taking it from this to the, um, Williamstown play festival to the new Haven, Connecticut off, you know, you know, uh, long wharf theater. And then finally getting a off Broadway, uh, contract. But that was, that was really kind of one of those things that, Always, in retrospect, I go, that's, that's very unusual. Richard, I'm wondering if you were still doing theater while your television and film career was taking off. Or specifically, I read that you were in the world premiere of Baby Dance, which you just referred to at the Pasadena Playhouse, and later reprised the role at the Williamstown Theater Festival, the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven, and then the Showtime movie in 1998. Can you tell us more about that? Williamstown Play Festival is what they sometimes call is kind of like summer camp for actors, especially in New York. They're very, all very well-known actors. And what they do is they use it, uh, Williamstown Play Festival, many times they'll, they'll try out new plays or they'll do old favorites and, uh, and actors who have gone to doing mostly TV and film, but had a roots and love doing theater, it was a chance for them to go up there. It's beautiful uh, in the Berkshires. Christopher Reeve was a big supporter and really they talked it up and it was just a, a wonderful atmosphere to be in. We were asked for one segment of the summer and then because of popular demand, we came back for another segment and then um, a producer from Connecticut was in the audience and and so six months went by and we then took it to the Long Wharf Theater in um, Connecticut and uh, after that run a producer uh, from the Lucille Lortel Theater in New York saw that and then took it to um, to uh, New York. Let's move on to early 1988. You've already accumulated quite a television resume and some films. We're going to hold to that position. I am constrained to abide by the terms of our agreement. Then you condemn us to death. Promise. You disgust me. If you could see the suffering the plague has caused. Well, you were going 
going to. And you see what it does to us. Now, the role of Romas made quite the impression on me as a child. There's many memorable characters you played, but this one shows, in my opinion, at least an award nomination. Richard, you sold this condition of suffering. You maybe not want to even try drugs. You're shaking, you're very intense. You show there's a highly addictive drug causing your character Romas and fellow Onar and Tajan to suffer from withdrawal symptoms. Please go into detail on how you landed this role, the research that went into playing the role, and maybe some of the memories you had in playing Romas in the Next Generation episode, Symbiosis. Sure. Uh... There's a wonderful uh, casting director, and people have probably mentioned her name many times. She's uh, a real pro. She loves actors. Her name's Junie Lowry, and she's she was the casting director on all the Star Treks that that I did, and um, she had had me in. Uh, she was having me in all the time. And if one, if I wasn't right for one, she didn't get discouraged and she didn't want me to get discouraged. She'd have me in for another and another. My idea of addiction, because I never really was into that kind of thing, but just, I, you just imagine the worst flu that you've ever had. You know, I'd watch documentaries of people going through withdrawal. Merritt, what a sweetheart he is. And it was so unfortunate that we lost him so early in his life. Um, he was great to work with. And we're very happy with your performance as well. This made a lasting impression. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. I don't know if you realize this, Richard, but a return to the planet Ornara finally occurred in the latest animated Star Trek Lower Deck series. I was really hoping to see your character pop up and you do a cameo. Now, were you asked to reprise Romas? If so, would you reprise the role even in an animated form? Yeah. As Michael Caine said, you never turn down a role. <laughs> <laughs> he said, my, he said the, the secret to my success for, was I never turned down a role that somebody was generous enough to offer me. And that's how I fig. I mean, of course. But right now, I mean, I had done it for 34 years. And there's, as I said, there's so many things that go into acting. I, I got out of, I actually live right outside of Los Angeles in Valencia, which is much more child friendly. And so I went up there when I had a, a son and so he could go into Boy Scouts and ride bikes in the street. Let's get to another first season appearance for you in Star Trek, this time on Deep Space Nine episode titled Dax. Richard, besides Dax, you were one of the first Deep Space Nine Trill aliens with a prominent role. Did the producers or casting bring you in any other time or specifically for this role of Selen Piers for your strong portrayal of Romas? Or was this a different circumstance like a fresh auditions book solely by your agent? Can you tell us about your time on set as well as playing the expert on Trill named Selen Piers? They were two different series and some time had passed when they're doing this, they do a mask of your face because that's just standard operation is that they 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 make a mold of your face so that um, each day, because they take it off and they're kind of delicate and a lot of times they'll, they'll kind of rip because you don't want it to come off in the middle of filming. So they put it on pretty good. Um, so they uh, make that mold of your face so that they can every... You know, every day you have a new prosthetic that's that's put on, and um, and that's always in interesting too. Um, and costume was was interesting. Um, you always go in and get fit for costumes, and they they'll tailor the costumes for you. And um, yeah, there's a lot of preparation that that goes into it, and um, you're usually called to the set a good hour before a lot of times two hours before or more before you have to actually be on set um, uh, just in case they run into problems or <laughs> I don't uh, but it's uh, the whole process is, is never failed to interest me so 
Um, and again, you meet lots of great people on the crew, lots of great makeup artists, people who have, you think, I might have stories. Think of the stories that they have of all the different guests, stars that, that have been on. And they'll tell stories about them. And it's always entertaining getting your makeup put on because a lot of times it takes a while. It does take a while. It, you know, even on the simplest looking uh, makeup, you know, it could, it could take easily an hour. Richard, your role of Keswick on Star Trek Enterprise was much later. Honestly, I hated to see the fate of Keswick so early in this episode, admiring your portrayal of him being a slave on a grim, gray, trillium mining planet so early in the episode. Tell us, did you think back to previous Star Trek roles when you first heard about this one? And what was the experience like working on Paramount again on Star Trek, this time as Keswick? It's always great. And they always... Um... I'm trying to think. They always pretty much had the same sound stage, you know, because it the the series each series is sequential. It's not like they were shooting them at the same time. So, um, f for Enterprise, um, everything was kind of familiar. It was kind of like coming back to. Um, an old high school or or whatever that you had gone to in the past and um you know different character uh and and it was a it was just interesting and of course each time it's different the sets are different um the setup is different um so uh you know sometimes you have a lot of physicality and, and this one was one that had a lot of physicality and it was fun seeing how they make, for instance, when you're crawling through the ducts or something, you know, it looks like you're hanging straight up, but it's really at a kind of a slant and you have to make it look like, you know, you'd fall. You could slide because we had to do that uh, uh, when the molten metal was coming up and we had to get the heck out of that thing um we had to slide down but it all of it was uh, a physical thing uh, a lot of dialogue because again there's a lot of philosophy in um in um all of the star trek episodes uh which i think makes it you know a thinking person's uh series and what i enjoyed about it a Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. We're in the middle of a fascinating and fun-filled interview with Richard Lineback. Richard, were you a big Star Trek fan growing up as a teen in the late 1960s? If so, who are the Star Trek universe would you have always wanted to meet or wish you could have met if they were still alive? I know you worked with Patrick Stewart and Jonathan Frakes. Whom have you had the pleasure of actually getting to know while working on a Star Trek set or someone associated with Star Trek? I actually got to work with William Shatner. Really? On a, a series called T.J. Hooker. Now, I was way too young when he was doing Star Trek to have, you know, been on it unless it was like a Will Wheaton character or something. <laughs> but, um, but... I was able to work with him um, and meet him and talk with him uh, doing an entirely different series. So that that was fun. I would have loved to have met um, Leonard Nimoy. He's just an interesting person and um, I, I would have loved to have picked his brain just about everything. I would have loved to sat down and had uh, lunch or dinner with him. Wow, yes, Brian and I too would have both loved to have met Leonard Nimoy as well. Yes. Such a powerful mind and a, really a top-notch actor too. Oh, and I'm sure it was a cool experience working with William Shatner as well. No. Yeah. Richard, you worked with a few very familiar actors from before and after Star Trek, Robert O'Reilly in particular, and Armin Shimmerman, plus a few others. Can you tell us about that? Robert O'Reilly, because he's a good friend of mine. Really? Really, That's we cool. actually did an episode of Max Headroom together <laughs> way back then. Wow. And we named Theater Company. Oh, you did? Really? You yeah, yeah. Company. 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, and he's directed me in some things. Um, uh, and uh, Armin Shimmerman. Oh yeah, he's cool. But and uh, we did we did a production of Mr. Roberts for the stage, where Armin Shimmerman was the captain, Robert O'Reilly was Doc, and I was uh, the Henry Fonda, Mr. Roberts. <laughs> All so together. All three, it's it's so you know it can be such a huge you know world out there with twenty thousand actors in in California trying to make it, but in the end of the day, it, it can be a very small world too. Um, I, I've 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 worked with Patrick Stewart again. Really on on a episode. Uh, it was a movie. Uh, Oh, TNT movie, I think it was called the uh, the King of Texas, and it was set in 1835 Texas, and it was really the story of King Lear, but told from the the Republic of Texas time. Marcia Gay Harden was in it. Uh, David Allen Greer was in it. I met Jonathan Frakes when I was doing theater. And, well, not met because I'd met him before, but I, I was able to talk to he and Jeannie Francis uh, in doing um, theater in New York when I was doing that. And uh, we reminisced. So uh, it's it's funny how you you keep running into to people like that. Um, so I've been I've been really lucky, I think. Yeah, you have absolutely all those names I mean, are familiar. I, I mean, just in the people that I meet, yeah. it's uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the projects I do uh, have um, good actors in it, and a lot of times because of that, they they all a lot of them started on stage, and they really had to bust their behinds to uh, get to, um, you know, where where they were able to make some money at it mm -hmm. and, and do what they love. So uh, a lot of the people I know, a lot of the actors I know, um, they just, uh, they're, they're very kind, they're very gracious. They know what it's like when you're a struggling actor to come up and especially um, the cast of, uh, of, of all the Star Trek, because they use, a lot of times they use actors that you hadn't heard of before, mm -hmm. or maybe had seen as guest stars on, on something else in TV. And um, they all remember where they came from, and, and they're all... Uh, really, really nice people, and it was a, a joy to be on the set. On the sound stages and sets at Paramount from Star Trek, what are some of your favorite moments or even an inside story that you recall that you can share from one of your appearances? I remember the first time I was in there, um, you know, you'd go up to costumes because they were uh, the costume, I, I believe it was it's on Paramount, and I'm trying to think if it was in one of the office buildings that was right near the um, right near the sound stage. Yeah, so I remember going upstairs and going in there, and having a costume thing. By the second time I was there, uh, they actually had a. Um, I believe they had a, a metal detector or something as you go into the costume room uh, because um, they had to make sure that people weren't trying to, there were a lot of props up there too. They had to make sure that people weren't going in there and uh, taking off, <laughs> taking away things surreptitiously to sell online on eBay or something like that. And I, uh, they must have had some kind of, uh, situation with costumes and props disappearing because I remember uh, it was either, I can't remember if it was Deep Space Nine, it was probably Enterprise by the time that was there, then they had to just make sure, I'm sure they put like little tags on everything like you're at the supermarket or something like that uh, hidden, uh, but they, at that point, 
everybody wanted. I mean, they 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 may have even had people walking in off the lot, you know, saying, you know, looking around and seeing what what they could what they could take out, what kind of souvenir. Um, but that that was that was interesting because I never crossed my mind. But now that I think about it, of course, who wouldn't want a phaser? <laughs> <laughs> of course we would. Authentic phaser props. Now that's a keepsake. For sure. <laughs> Richard, you've had a long and I'm sure rewarding career as an actor. What is the most memorable role or your favorite role that you've ever played on film, television or theater? The baby dance just because i i did it it was a starring role um it was something that was close to me the story line is um a poor louisiana uh, couple who can't afford to keep one more child they have tons of kids so reluctantly they're giving the baby up for adoption and uh there's uh, a Los Angeles couple that's upper middle class that desperately are trying to adopt a child. And it's the culture clash of when uh, the Los Angeles couple meets the very poor Louisiana couple. And um, my character tries to get everything I can money wise. I, I wanted four new tires for my car. <laughs> Uh, you know, my my demands kind of kept going up and up. Thank you so much, Richard. It's been such a pleasure having you here on A Captain's Log. Thank you for having me. Like I said, it's a great show. Um, love Star Trek. Um, and I really appreciate you uh, uh, having me on. Absolutely. It's, it's nice to reminisce. Yes, thank you so much, Richard. Trekkies, thank you for watching us on your local TV stations or Roku channel. And be sure to check us out on Instagram at a captain's log show. Don't forget the underscores. And of course, a captain's log is available on your local broadcast TV station, Roku, and our YouTube channel under a captain's log show. Yes, Lily and I hope you enjoyed our amazing Richard Lineback interview and Star Trek news. Bye for now. Yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy.